All set, hon. Okay, we're all set. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming to the Enrichment Academy in class of Incredible Journey. As you've had time to see, we're we'll going through all these situations here today. So, we're going to start now. Today, we're going to cover a lot of incredible journeys that will inspire and challenge our imaginations, plus help us understand and appreciate the beauty and grandeur our world has to offer. These journeys will detail natural and man-made environments to test our resolve and courage that give all of us the ultimate adventure. So the first one is uh, El Camino de Santiago, or Way of James. It's an ancient medieval Christian pilgrimage trail uh, in northern Spain, walked in a westerly direction. Uh, generally from here to here, and we have better maps in Spain. Uh, it's 800 kilometers long with 500 miles and takes five weeks on dirt trails and 100,000 hikers a year uh, hike it. And it starts right up here in uh, northern France and western northern France at a town called uh, Saint Jean Pied de Port. And the trip starts with a group of fellow hikers, generally Europeans, and a coordinated group in northwest France. And your first leg walks over the Pyrenees, and then the well-marked and main train trail is hev uh, heavily marked, heavily traveled, and proceeds west through northern Spain to end up in Santiago, Spain. And it ends up at a church in Santiago where the, where the end is, where uh, St. James and his 800-year-old remains are interned, according to legend. And along the way that you walk, there are hostels here. Along the way, uh, other hostels with these kind of accommodations, simple beds, and uh, the lodging and meals are served. Plus, hikers stay in towns and cities they pass through. Hikers usually walk at least a dozen miles a day. A pilgrim's passport, then, is stamped in the towns as they travel through. And when reaches the end, they get a certificate of accomplishment. So. The thing is, is, just follow the sign of the shell. And you will, you will go more into this in the detail. Many people have walked this trail for numerous reasons. For it is mainly a spiritual journey, and for some a form of penance, with hikers doing it for a religious purpose or spiritual one. One could say that this long trail can, um, this long path, can cleanse and purify the soul and be a time for reflection. Another. For others, it's a physical challenge to get away from business and contact with nature and simplicity, or some to talk about other cultures and get to know them. Walking it for more than a month and going at it for a while, one can get a better perspective. You don't have to walk the entire thing, but you can walk part of it. So you generally walk through towns like this, following this signa, insignia, and going on trails. You can even bicycle the thing if you wish. There are a number of other routes for this pilgrimage through uh, Portugal and central Spain, but the northern trail heading west is the most popular. So when you start out here, excuse me, when you start out here, you're going to go through towns like Pamplona, Burgos, Leon, and about 30 towns as you progress in your five week turn journey, going about a dozen miles a day through these kind of towns. During the journey, one can experience the charm of small Spanish towns and villages, scenes like this, or scenes like this, of lush vineyards, pretty vistas, pastoral scenery, rural countryside, green rolling hills, and grazing livestock. And so this is really about uh, a long winding road that goes, following these people here. One takes a big backpack that has all your needs in it, uh, like <coughs> rain gear, socks, shirts, long short pants, uh, toiletries, water. And as you travel through northern Spain, you get to see this. And the end, of course, will be at the cathedral here, uh, where St. James is buried. And you go through towns like this, and on paths just like this. And really, this whole thing is about the journey, not the outcome, it's really Canterbury Tales, if you take a look at it, 
there's a film I'd recommend called The Way, W-A-Y, you can get it, it details this, not in a documentary, but in the form of a Hollywood movie. And that's how I first learned about this, because we don't know anything about it being here. So now from this personal uh, land journey, we're gonna move on to a deep underwater discovery. In June of 1989, Dr. Robert Ballard found the wreck of the German battleship Bismarck. The Bismarck uh, was found in the Atlantic Ocean, off a couple, 300 miles off Brest, where it had sunk there. And actually, the, the water is 15,700 feet deep. That's three miles down, with a pressure on it of 9,000 pounds psi. And she was Germany's largest battleship. She was 820 feet long and weighed 50,000 tons, fully loaded. It was able to sail at 30 knots, had 15 kind of guns on it, and it was meant to destroy Allied ships. And she carried 162 enlisted men and 100 officers. She was first launched by Nazi Germany in 1940. This Bismarck then was responsible uh, for sinking the Hood, a large British destroyer that had 1,400 British sailors on it and, and died. The Bismarck was key to Hitler's plans to blockade Britain. In May of 1941, though, she was only afloat for about eight months, and then she ran into trouble because we came along, or the Allies came along and bombed her. Uh, in May of 41, she was sunk by numerous British battleships, plus Allied torpedoes and bombers in a tremendous, dramatic sea battle. Sink the Bismarck, remember that phrase. Mm -hmm. 2,000 of her sailors perished, and only 100 survived. She was afloat for just early eight months until her spectacular demise, when she was sailing only in the North Atlantic. And the heavily damaged sinking ship struck an extinct 3,000 foot tall underwater volcano on its three mile descent and slid down the mountain, coming to a rest two thirds of the way down. The battery turrets and aircraft guns are still in their proper position, but the conning tower and bridge are heavily damaged. The propellers are visible, but in the debris field that surrounds the hull lays the foremost mainstay, main mast, excuse me, and, and funnel. The stern or back part of the ship had broken away and has yet to be found. Dr. Ballard had found the Titanic only a few years earlier in 1985 in the North Atlantic. He also discovered the Lewis Tana and even John F. Kennedy's PT-109. He discovered the Bismarck pretty much two-thirds intact, resting upright. He explored the wreck, shown here with his deep sea submersible called the Alvin. This small manned craft can dive three miles underwater and it takes six hours to come up to the surface. It has two machine arms that can lift heavy objects or take samples. It has three portholes and a top speed of two miles per hour. And this was the Bismarck he was looking at. And here's his Alvin. Uh, the Alvin is stored on a surface ship and is taken out and in and out of the water with a crane. So riding the Alvin is a unique journey where one can witness underwater archeology span plus better understand a small piece of wartime history. And this is to be left as a underwater graveyard. So he's, a, he's written books on this, Dr. Ballard, and is a very brave man for going down that deep where nobody has gone before. Uh, from the depths of our world, now to the very top of it, or a total of 44,000 feet in elevation, we will discuss climbing the holy grail of all mountains, Mount Everest. It, its summit lies on the border of Nepal to the south and Tibet, China to the north. So it's right on the border of those two countries. And it is 29,019 feet tall, uh, which is uh, just about 5,000 feet shorter than the altitude at which commercial planes fly. Uh, 4,000 people have successfully climbed this mountain, mainly from the Nepal side. And about that includes about uh, 400 women, by the way. Over 300 people have died climbing the world's tallest mountain. The bodies of more than 200 there are still on the mountain and are just too hard to remove. They're frozen in place. 
The temperature on this mountain never gets above freezing and is usually between negative four and negative 30 below with extreme wind. Climbers really climb into the stratosphere and there can be wind speeds of over 100 miles per hour with avalanches, storms, whiteout conditions, and no shelter. So, what's it like doing this? Well, first you need a permit. Uh, you get a permit from Nepal. That costs $11,000. Nepal is notorious for not administrating this kind of situation. They let too many hikers up, and we shall see this causes a problem. However, you still have to buy one. Now, even if you don't make it to the summit and do it again, you have to buy another one. And it, uh, the costs for this are uh, uh, about $8,000 for training, travel, insurance, and gear. And there's other costs with to be on a team. The price range for a standard supported professional excursion can cost between fifty-five dollars to $85,000. With a custom climb, it comes to over $100,000. And there's no guarantee to reach the summit. Uh, also, you have to pay for uh, Sherpas, porters, and guides. And they come uh, for about uh, ten dollars to $35,000 for a hiking team to be on. And each bottle of uh, oxygen costs $465, and most hikers use seven bottles of it. So this will really put you in, uh, you really have to have the money to be able to do this situation. Now, one trains for this uh, monumental climb for months and years in advance with four to eight hours of strenuous daily training and to, for mental and physical acuity and uh, interval training with a heavy backpack also helps. And you need to be able to work with these kind of situations. And if you don't do this, you just can't go up and be a novice about it and go up there. You have to train to go up. Hmm. And you also need, uh, besides training, you need this kind of equipment. You need to do these kind of exercises, for instance. You need this kind of equipment. You do not buy this stuff from Walmart. <laughs> you go out and you find professional companies that provide you with a tent that doesn't get knocked over in 100 mile an hour winds. You need special shoes with crampons on it for the ice. You need ropes. You need materials to work with, camping equipment. And this is serious, dangerous hiking. You also could stay in the hyperbaric chamber to increase, to increase the blood cells in your body to carry more oxygen when you go up this high, because there isn't as much. So sleeping in one is fine uh, for a number of months. Uh, you need to have three, uh, you really should have uh, a mountain experience, climbing experience before going on this trip up Everest. You really have needed to climb the 19,000 foot Kilimanjaro mountains before, or the 16,000 foot Mount Blanc in Europe, or the 20,000 foot um, Denali in Mount, or Mount McKinley in Alaska, or the 18,000 foot Elbrus in southern Russia, or this one here, the Aconcagua in Argentina. So you just don't go up. You have, should climb these mountains before so you know what you're doing. And at 29,000 feet, there's one third of the air pressure at sea level. This then seriously reduces the amount of oxygen your body needs. Above 19,000 feet, one needs bottled oxygen breathed in through a face mask. Hikers try to increase their lung capacity by taking in as much oxygen as possible. So it's a high, what they call the VO2 rate, blind of oxygen, is needed to have this. So how does this start out? You need to type the base camp. You cannot take a helicopter or there's no roads there. Once you get to a certain point, you have to hike it in. Helicopters don't work at this level. And only animals go so far, and that's why you have yaks that come up with you to take uh, your equipment and hiking supplies and tents and necessary supplies. The journey to base camp starts with climbers on a com commercial assistance experience team uh, starting at base camp, and it takes about six or between six to ten days to climb this to base camp. And what that looks like is here you fly into here, and then you got to hoof it in to base camp, 
and you're going up a mile in elevation to do this. So all this time, you need to get acclimated to the high altitude. That's why you take your time going somewhere, because once you go up these thousand, like 5,000 feet, everything changes in your body. So you have to be very careful. I'm going to spend uh, four or five days at base camp here, which looks like this, to get acclimated, to adjust to the altitude, rest, and store up for needed energy. At base camp, there are showers, toilets, heaters, computers for last minute weather reports, and info uh, uh, for last minute weather reports. This is the last hurrah for any kind of creature comforts. From here, it gets, gets difficult. And Sherpas right here, that is uh, usually male Tibetans, local Tibetans or, or Nepalese, are experienced guide and, and are needed to ascend the mountain, and they earn about $6,000 for every expedition. There's also, um, you know, it looks like this for base camp. So when you go there, this is where you start, and you spend a few days here before you go up. And there's also a uh, garbage deposit for the weekly collection of human waste, which is taken to a large hole in the ground down in the valley. So a lot of garbage has piled up in the last 30 years, and once you go up the mountain, no one's going to take it down. So this, uh, this journey really takes about 64 days, and you start in mid-March, and you want to ascend in mid-May, mid 60 days later, because the weather is better for going up. There's a break in the weather in mid-May. So this is about 64 days, but about 45 days of actual core climbing, but about 20 days at least getting uh, adjusted to the altitude, which is terribly important. And this will be uh, how this goes right here. This will be the base camp, and you need to climb up this glacier called Tumba Ice Ball. It goes more than about a couple miles actually to get to camp one. And this is very treacherous right in here. So this is a large glacier. We're gonna get into this with a lot of pictures. And this is called the Kumbu, Kumbu Ice Fall. And it's a vast and dangerous ice fall area consisting of thousands of house sized chunks of ice and snow. This is called, this ice fall, I'm sorry, this ice fall is really a river of ice or a glacier that moves several feet a month and takes at least 12 hours to cross it. So you're going right up here, right up into it, and you have to make these very dangerous ascents. Ladders and ropes have been set up in this area. This area is uneven, treacherous, and requires ladders attached to ice to vertically get over enormous blocks of jumbled up ice and snow. And these are the hikers going through this. Remember, you're going to go up another, at least a half mile up in elevation doing this. There's different routes going up these, this large area. But I wanted to show you more dramatic pictures. I thought this, every time I look at this, my hands get, get wet. Who would want to do that? This is, this is really, putting, really putting it on the line. Or this. Oh. <laughs> Or this, and, and set up these ladders. They have these ice fall. Let me take off this better. I'm sorry, I'll rush that. They have these ice fall doctors that come in. These are really local uh, Nepalese that come up and set these ladders up, usually in early May, uh, before the hikers come up, so people can ascend this. Without these ladders, without this kind of work, you can't get up at all. They are really the un unsung heroes. <laughs> And there are millions of tons of ice here. It moves south very slowly, and avalanches are a real constant threat. The massive blocks of ice are very tall, and, and they make it easier, though. Uh, these ladders make it easier to get up. Who would catch me down on my map? So the police, they come up here, and someone has to be the guinea pig when these ice ball doctors come up. And then someone has to walk across it to check this out. And then they have to set up guidelines and to be sure it's insecure. And you see how much they're carrying here, don't you? So you might have to take this ice fall trip and go up and then come back down because your body has to get acclimated because you know best what it feels like. 
So you might have to come down to, and then go back up to camp one. Finding these ice falls then makes it easier to get to camp one. Let me go back. And later ascend to the desired south call, COL, or mountain pass to reach the summit. So avalanche in these areas has killed 16 uh, Sherpa mountain guides mm -hmm. in the past, so you bet this is dangerous. So you might have to come back down to get acclimated. <coughs> uh, camp one is at 19,900 feet, and then camp two here uh, is on the well-known and traveled Southeast Ridge and is at 21,300 feet. And there's also sometimes cooks and helpers at the lower camps to assist climbers. And then it gets significantly harder as you uh, travel, travel up. So right now we're at camp two, and you still have to get all the way up to the top here. That's what the camp three will be next. You have to ascend thousands of feet uh, of steep mountain, mountainous uh, terrain to the next camp. Camp three is at 23,500 feet up here and is located on a small ledge on the southern face of the mountain. Between Camp 3 and Camp 4 is only 2,000 feet, but it's a tough grueling slog, and looks like this going to Camp 4 as you go up higher. Climbing at this altitude consumes between 6,000 to 10,000 calories per day, and this is what it looks like. And you can see then from the top of what you need to go to, which is about three or 4,000 feet uphill. Uh, this is from Camp 4 going up. And you can see clearly your uh, goal. But what goes on here is that at this point, things start to deteriorate quickly and it's impossible to replenish calories burned through eating food. food. And once at this 26,000 elevation feet, or Camp 4, which is right up here, this is known as the death zone. And uh, you get altitude sickness starts start to set in. Many hikers have perished in this unforgiving zone, and it is difficult to sleep. The digestive system slows down, and simple chores like making coffee or, or adjusting gear and tends to become very difficult. So when you excuse me, when you camp up here, if it takes 15 minutes to make a cup of coffee for you normally, it'll take 45 minutes. You can't think clearly. It's extremely cold, and the wind conditions are tough. And that's why it's known as the death zone. <laughs> and it, this is when high climbers use bottled oxygen. And at this point, they can experience, hikers can experience hallucinations and unclear thinking. You can get uh, pulmonary edema, cerebral edema, or blood embolisms. And at this point, the body starts to break down. Frostbite can occur. And our bodies really aren't meant to be at this level. That's what this, you only can visit it for a little bit. And the uh, body cannot regulate its temperatures and the brain starts to swell. So then the next step is to go from camp four to the summit. And this is the perilous journey you need to take getting up there. Don't slip. And then they go up and mass uh, summit, usually in mid-May. In 2018, 807 climbers ascended, and they go up because there's a break in the weather. With clear skies and low wind, with cooperating weather, the summit can be reached. There's a window for, uh, for climbers to go up this way. This is when hundreds of climbers can reach the summit in a few hour window of good opportunity. So at this point, it's either summit or plummet. <laughs> the problem is, is that you have to wait in line going up. And you only have bottled oxygen, so you have to reserve that oxygen inside. So you have to reserve your oxygen to be able to make it up. And that's why 11 hikers died just three years ago. They, could, they didn't have the oxygen to go up. You're not that far from going up, but you might need your oxygen. So you have to uh, be conservative with what you have. And all these hikers have paid $100,000 at least to go up. They've left their families, they're risking their lives. They, they, they have equipment on them that weighs 80 pounds and they've waited for years to do this just to get up to there. Oh my. So at the very top, 
there is a uh, dining room size table where people just stay really a few minutes and take a picture and then come down. So this is what it looks like and you're really on top of the world and uh, the view is uh, something else. Exactly. You're going to need this exactly. one. <laughs> Very good. You'll notice, by the way, on their feet, it isn't just shoes, it goes all the way up to the knee. Mm -hmm. Everything is protected, double and triple mm -hmm. layers. So, clearly climbing this mountain is a life-changing event. I don't know how to do it. As it concerns testing the very limits of us. So that's what it takes to go up Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. Now for something a little bit different here. Okay. We're going to discuss something more down to earth and at sea level, but still frigid, such as hiking across the North Pole. It's 480 miles across and is 6 to 10 feet thick, thick of ice. And beneath, under, under one's feet, is the immense, deep, and frigid Arctic Ocean. So what's going on is this is the Arctic Ocean. It is 5 million square miles, one and a half times bigger than the United States. You can hike across it if you start at Svalbard in Norway and Ireland and go here like this, or from Ellsmore Island to go in like this, and your route looks like this. So you can do this. And you're walking on ice and underneath is an immense and deep ocean. So this is what it means walking. And you have to pull a 200 pound sled loaded with supplies for about 50 to 70 days. And what's going on here, there are pressure ridges because the ice builds up and then builds back down, you have to go over. So it's not just all smooth sailing. And I wanted to uh, emphasize a woman here. In 1988, Helen Thayer, a hero of mine, was the first woman to trek it solo across the North Pole. She pulled her own sled without resupply with her dog, Charlie, a husky. Right there. And it, it, her 365 mile trip took one month for the magnetic North Pole. She took Charlie along, who the local Inuits there said would warn her and protect her from polar bears. She was alerted nine times during her trip, which saved her life. If she didn't have the dog, she'd be bowled to death within a few days. And she's my hero because she did many other things. She walked 4,000 miles across the Sahara Desert from Morocco to the Nile River. And she walked, as shown here, 1,600 miles across the Mongolia's Gobi Desert at age 63 with her 74-year-old husband, Bill, and two camels. So she has legs of Titanic. It was 126 degrees there. She battled sandstorms, dehydration, drug smugglers, and scorpions. And it took her 60 days to go across the Gobi without a support team or radio. So across this area here. She was the first non-indigenous woman to hike, to kayak 1,200 miles of two remote Amazon rivers and lived alongside a wolf den for six months in the Yukon with her husband and pet dog. So she has been on the lecture circuit. She does these kind of things. And that's why I like her. Now, so one can go solo across the North Pole, which is extremely dangerous, or join a professional hiking service. And you can do this. And beneath this guy, this guy right, that's the Arctic Ocean underneath. And this, this is what you're pulling. But you can go with the team. They're called Ice Trek Polar Expeditions. And uh, and it costs about forty-two thousand euros. This includes the equipment helicopter transfers when you get to the North Pole, expert guiding, ex uh, expedition food, and training. You have to pull a 110 pound sled over ice drifts through very uneven, rugged ice terrain. In the summer, uh, it's still freezing, but you get 24 hours of sunlight, and so that's when you do this in April. <laughs> sometimes you just take three miles, sometimes you just travel three miles in eight hours and eight hours of traveling. Then you get picked up by helicopters. Mm -hmm. So you can also do a different way of doing this. Uh, you can also ski across. And mm -hmm. um, besides that, you would need this kind of equipment. Uh, either hiking or skiing, you need everything to be waterproof. You need all kinds of backpacks, emergency supplies, 
every kind of situation, it's something to carry yourself in and to get over water. And you need a shovel, and I would assume this is a gun, and all kinds of communication devices. Once you get hypothermia, you're, you're cooked. And this can lead to it's severe frozen. frostbite it's on like fingers and toes. So you can ski across too, and this is called the North Pole Last Degree, which is a three week excursion on skis across the North Pole. It costs 54,000 euros. You get picked up in a town called Long, Long Urban and then ski it into here. And you pull about 150 pounds for about 20 days, going about 150 miles by skiing. And they give you food and stove fuel, stove fuel, ski training, sleeping bags, tents and sleds, safety and navigation and communication equipment, hotel accommodations in Long Urban, and insurance for evacuation. So this is how you ski across. This is generally what it looks like this way. You have to go across, across these pressure ridges, skiing across. This is what this looks like. Again, carrying your things. This is what he's taking. And again. So once you get to your destination, uh, you ski for about uh, 12 kilometers per day, which is probably about eight miles. And when one reaches the North Pole, a helicopter picks one up by a professional company. Here's some more like this. Let's take a look at the helicopter. They, they pick you up a helicopter and take you back. So you can ski one way and then come back to the helicopter. Now we're going to move uh, to the International Space Station from something down on Earth, way up high, about 250 miles up high. This vast, for I'm sorry, this International Space Station, or ISS, is a multinational collaborative project and is a modular space station 250 miles up in what they call LEO, Low, low Earth Orbit. It's divided into two sections, a Russian one and the United States one. Astronauts from different nations all work together to perform science experiments and test systems and equipment for future Moon and Mars expeditions. It weighs 935,000 pounds, is 240 feet long, is 237 feet wide, and has continually been occupied for 20 years and orbits the Earth at 17,000 MPH and costs over $130 billion and is the most expensive item ever made. It is 32, 000, has 32,000 cubic feet of, of pressurized space inside of it. And back in the day, before, uh, before what we're doing uh, now using um, SpaceX, after 2011, the space shuttle missions ended and NASA used the Russian Soyuz rockets from an air base in Kazakhstan, here, uh, to take American and Russian astronauts to the ISS. The Soyuz is expendable and can carry three astronauts and lands on soil when it returns to uh, Earth. The force blasting off is 3G, or three times Earth's gravity, and over 230 individuals in two decades were sent up with over 400 space flights. So the rocket has to climb 250 vertical miles and then max the ISS speed of 17,000 MPH and then perfectly align with it. These are the old Russian astronauts, but now SpaceX is able to do this and deliver astronauts and cargo to the ISS with its Falcon 9. Some of you have seen launched um, in the air. And the SpaceX Dragon capsule has sent supplies and unmanned ISIS the ISS 21 times and sent two astronauts up. I've done that a couple of times now. Uh, this Falcon 9 rocket ha has nine Merlin engines on it that generate 1.3 million pounds of thrust to give a liftoff. This makes us less reliant on the Russians to send astronauts up. It takes 19 to 27 hours to orbit the Earth and to catch up and line up with the ISS to dock with it. I wanted to show you this because this is what it takes to do this. And we'll be talking about these solar panels too on the ISS in a little bit. But this is generally the how they dock with it. They deliver supplies, number one, and astronauts, number two, and then retake returning 
uh, returning garbage back and astronauts back home. So this is them docking with it. Uh, uh, actually, it cost $1.2 billion for eight trips, or about $55 billion per seat when using the SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule. And she looks like this. Okay, so what's it like, like to live up there? We got the facts in the ISS. So what's that like being up there? Okay, first of all, eating in space is very much like camping. Some foods can be eaten in their natural food, food form, such as fruit or brownies. Other foods like pastas or meals have to have, to have water added. There's a small oven to heat foods, but with no refrigeration. Condiments like salt, pepper, and mustard are in liquid form, so the particles cannot cause vents. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner and snacks are available on board, mostly from disposable packages that ensure proper meal size, nutrition, and calorie intake. Drinks are also available like coffee, tea. They have 55 computers on board, and every single space is used up with all kinds of equipment, gear, and specialized uh, necessity things. The lights are on 24 hours because they get a, they're in darkness for 45 minutes and light for 45 minutes. They have 12 hours, but in different ways. And how do they take care of themselves in space? I know that's on your mind. <laughs> Inside the ISS, the astronauts have the same hygiene as people on Earth with different procedures. They wash their hair with a rinseless shampoo and squeeze packets of water and liquid soap from pouches onto their skin. It's really a high-tech sponge bath. And because of microgravity, the space station toilet is a little bit more complicated to use. And this is how this works. The astronauts position themselves on the toilet using leg restraints, and the toilet acts like a vacuum cleaner with fans that suck air and waste into the commode. Each astronaut has a personal urinal funnel that needs to be attached to a hose adapter and to the waste tank. The American side recycles their own urine and air condensate using filters and iodine, getting four gallons of drinkable water. Mm. And in the fall, they closed, uh, they, this fall of 2020, they uh, put up a $27 million titanium toilet to take care of any problems up there. So this is the kind of procedure that you use. They also brush their teeth in space with an injectable toothpaste. So they do the same things we do, but just a bit different. Mm -hmm. And they have to exercise in space about two hours a day to prevent bone loss and muscle atrophy. They can run on a treadmill, and use tension cords and isometric weights to work out. Being weightless for six months leads to problems because when they come back to Earth, they cannot walk. No matter when they're on the ISS, it takes them a few days. Actually, they, they're like punch drunk when they walk and they don't have, they have vertigo and they fall over easy. So they have to be, it's very dangerous doing this. So they have to be lifted out of the capsule when they land uh, on, on Russian soil. These are Chinese astronauts, and they have to be lifted out right here. This will pose a problem on Mars, because once you go to Mars, you're in the space capsule for six months, and even though you've been working out, the problem is when you get on Mars, you're gonna be wobbly. So they have to fix that problem before they go up. And you can sleep on sp in the spacecraft, of course, on the ISS, in a tethered bag for any position, um, and uh, they have little crew, uh, mini cabins of this for one person, and they get eight hours of sleep. And this is them sleeping on it. You might need to put uh, something on your eyes because the lights are always on. You can sleep in any position that you want, and it will work out for you. During the day, the astronauts have many tasks to perform. They conduct science experiments that require their input, take part in medical experiments to check on how bo their bodies are adjusting to zero gravity, and maintain and monitor uh, space station sensors for safety and procedural situations. They perform safety checks, tests, and mission control helps them with messages, emails, radio commands, and instructions. Sometimes spacewalks are needed to fix things, and also they, also they are involved in um, selling uh, special products in space for commercial use, and the excuse me, uh, 
Estee Lauder, for instance, wants them to advertise, so they pay for that. Because <laughs> if you have your product by one of their windows, it looks very dramatic. Mm -hmm. And they have, not only do these astronauts have scheduled, but they have free time that they could use to, to talk to their family or relax or read. But one thing's for sure about on the ISS, you can't read the deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Falcon 9 delivers supplies up to them, uh, from them and carries hundreds of pounds of supplies like clean clothes, uh, food, water, and needed equipment or parts for new science experiment packages. And the same capsule, oh, by the way, this is the water. They bring that up in these, these um, big cartons. They weigh 11 pounds of water, which weighs 100 pounds. So they have to have water up there to get oxygen. We'll talk about that in a second. And this is what it looks like inside. Pretty sciencey, right? and the, uh, the packages that they have stored here. So how do they get water up there? Well, first of all, they have wa water, they have hundreds of gallons of water that's been brought up. So in order to get air, they use electrolysis. And they take the necessary oxygen on board through electrolysis. This uses electricity from the station's massive solar panels here to split water into hydrogen gas and oxygen by running a current through a tank of water to cause the atom to separate into separate elements. Then the oxygen is stored in a tank. And scrubbers and filters take out carbon dioxide and waste air, and waste water, waste air. The ISS produces 160 uh, watts, kilowatts of electricity, um, which is enough to power 40 homes. And they bump this up to 215 uh, this summer 215 kilowatts, which is enough to hold about to power 70 homes. Half that power is used to recharge batteries. So that's how they get they in order to get air, they have to take it from the water. So if you go to Mars, by the way, they'll have to do the same thing. They have to carry hundreds of pounds of water to be able to generate electricity from probably solar panels to go out there to do this. Okay, so this is an uh, incre incredible journey as astronauts uh, become involved in, in the space industry after they go up and it can change, literally change your life here. So this is an out of world experience. And then from the uh, lower orbit, we can now sail across the oceans and circumnavigate the world, our world. You can choose to sail around the world and it could take between nine to 15 months for a straightforward route and not going on any large detours. Of course, it could take three to five years if you wish to go longer. So how you do this is you follow the, first of all, there's special winds that you can follow and all oceans have what they call dyers or uh, large circular patterns of water that move through the, for instance, uh, the North Pacific, it goes in the clockwise position and the same thing in the Atlantic here we are by the Gulf Stream. And the streams run counterclockwise in the Southern Atlantic and Southern Pacific. And this area here we've been talking about here, this is where winds blow very, very, uh, uh, we call the uh, frigid 40s out here, because the wind blows very strong here. So you can use, you go around the world using these kind of currents, and that's how they know what to do. It helps speed. So they push boats uh, downwind. And also there's various routes to go around the world. Um, most, um, if you're gonna take a sailboat, for instance, and start in Florida here, you go through the Panama Canal, go out in the Pacific, go north of the, uh, excuse Australia. me, Australia, and come through the Indian Ocean under Cape of Good Hope and into South America and go up. Or there's other routes about going going through the Panama Canal, coming up through Australia, and coming in to the Indonesian area and going up the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean and out in the Atlantic. So there's different routes that you can use to sail. You wanna take a safe route, and that's why people uh, nick the edges of continents for a more safer route. So uh, would it, you have to be careful that there are hurricanes that occur in the Northern Hemisphere in July through October, and the Southern Hemisphere from December through April. So a safe and comfortable 
enjoyable route depends largely on the weather. So a boat will cost you between thirty and fifty thousand dollars, and probably about forty-five thousand dollars with insurance and inspections, and be between forty feet at minimum to sixty feet long, with an additional twenty thousand dollars more for special equipment that you're going to need, like this man here, um, like this solar panel to help to help uh, you get the energy you need for your boat. You're going to need generators, solar panels, a marine radio receiver, hydro vane, ropes, trackers, autopilot, sat phone, laptop with net connection, spare parts, fishing rods, emergency supplies, flares, medical kits, bilge pumps, emergency rafts, uh, specialized tools, repair kits, clothes, rain, uh, rain gear, propane, extra sail, and even if you stay at uh, not stay, go through the Panama Canal. It will cost you about two thousand dollars to do this, just to get your sailboat through. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know that when they sail. Uh, you can uh, go alone, or you can go with uh, be on a crew with another on a sailboat that travels around the world where there's less risk. Many yacht clubs are looking for crew members to help on board with daily chores and ship maintenance. It will take you about. Um, nine to 12 months going 29,000 miles to be able to go around the world going pretty quickly. And for sailing records for speed, they want you to be above a certain latitude where you can go by, by speed by going around these kind of situations starting in LA and coming again north of uh, Australia, going into here like this, or you can start in Victoria and British Columbia and follow the bottom of Australia, bottom of Africa, around here, the Roaring Forties is what they're called, and up to Victoria. So you can do this, and the uh, World Cruising Club here is a foreign company that lets average people sail around the world in special cruise yachts that starts in Australia or Santa Lucia. It takes 15 months on a 40 foot plus boat and sails 26,000 nautical miles on trade wind circumnavigation. 200 boats and 1,200 people each year do this journey. So you can pay to do this and go with the crew if you're really interested in doing it. Uh, and all boats, all boats take the voyage simultaneously, which is called a regatta. One, and you can do this also with just one ocean if you want. So these are some of the terms in sailing that you're gonna find out about how to maneuver your sail so when the wind's coming at you, you can tack. That's how Columbus got across the Atlantic Ocean. He put his sail to a different angle to catch the wind. You can do these kind of situations here. And I wanted to tell you about a special uh, event called the Bendy Globe. This made the news this in February. It's the world's toughest sailing race. It's really about a solo nonstop sailing race that happens once every four years from November to February and starts from a French city port. So this is a, about speed. If you really want to talk about speed and sailing, then this is a different, this is the world-class event. You start in France and you go from the go south in the North Atlantic into the South Atlantic and around uh, the, around Antarctica actually. You go around Antarctica and then come back up the uh, South Atlantic, come back north up and up the North Atlantic to here. So it'll look like this, really a big loop around Antarctica. And again, the, the route here. And these boats are on uh, hydrofoil. This is what makes them go very, very fast. And this is a very tough sailing race. It covers 24,000 miles with about 30 to 60 uh, sailing yachts. And This is a, they're on hydrofoil. Actually, each sailor carries, uh, each boat has, um, it takes about 75 days. Each boat has its own fresh water, and the person there is responsible for, uh, they only sleep for about five hours at a time. And the, these boats cost about four million, million euros, and they have to be sponsored by, oh, sorry, sponsored by companies uh, to be able to obtain these, because they're specialized boats that can travel at 60 miles per hour, 
using hydrofoil, which cuts down the amount of drag in the water. So I wanted to tell you about a sailing race that you can do also. Um, it takes about 75 days to do this. It's a very unique race. Now we're going to change gears and we're going to we just followed worldwide oceanic trans uh, currents. Now we're going to start with a single drop of water that turns into a snowflake that falls on the 18,000 foot Nevada Disney Mountain Peak in southern Peru, Andes, right down here, in southwestern Peru. It's about 100 miles west of Lake Titicaca and 430 miles southeast of Lima, Peru. So this is where the start of the Amazon River starts. And we're gonna follow this right now. The snowflake gets compressed into ice and becomes part of a mountain glacier. And when the snowpack or glacier melts, it trickles on the east side into a nearby brook called the Tarjustana, which is fed by the winter snows from this mountain. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow this from this area here from Lima and Lake Titicaca, or right here, and it's gonna follow northbound, this drop of water, and we're gonna go up here to where this headwaters of the Amazon River that empties into the Atlantic Ocean. So, uh, from this book, it merges with another river and becomes the Apurimatic River in Peru, which gets its water from the Andes as glacial meltwaters. This flows through the silver mining town of Kaliyama, down here, to go up north. And the river runs 650 miles north, past Cusco, Peru, and joins the Yurubamba River in east central Peru. So if you go to Machu Picchu, the river below is the Yurubamba, which is really the start of the Amazon River. You know, it's all muddy, from the, which picked up from all this mountains here. So you can see this from when you go to uh, uh, Machu Picchu. So it, it joins at the center of Peru, and you can see this from, from there. And then it forms the Utaliali River, and it heads north for 900 miles. So it basically goes up this way right in here, the Utaliali River, and looks like this as it takes really the mountains. It, the mountains are eroding because of this river. And then forms the Utali River, and it heads north for 900 miles. This becomes the headwater of the Amazon. So the Ucali River goes up here, and I'm just pronouncing it, and comes up to, which we'll talk about next, Iquitos, which is really the headwaters of the Amazon. We're still in Peru here, and this becomes Brazil here, right here. And then it heads east to the Atlantic Ocean. So let's talk about Iquitos, which is that town that I showed you, the headwaters. And Along the way is Iquitos on the Amazon River. It's really in northeastern Peru. Its population is 160,000, and it's the world's largest city, only the world's largest city not accessible by road. It can only be reached by airplane or boat, and it's the gateway to the Amazon River. So again, follows it to Iquitos here. And these are some of the simple things you can do in Iquitos. And here's some shots of it. I think these are just beautiful here. It's a very, uh, a, really a water life. This is what this, this town has. I think it best sums up this. And then it is another 900 miles from Iquitos right here to Manus. And that's where the start of usually most tours take uh, from Manus and you take the Amazon River tour by boat and you go this way to the Atlantic Ocean and you go into the Caribbean. That's uh, Manus. And it's really about 900 miles from there. And Manus has a population of 2 million and is the heart of the Amazon. It's a sophisticated city with a huge port for cargo ships and considered to be the Paris of the tropics as many cruise ships take tours there. It is a true modern city nestled in the world's largest rainforest. So again, we talked about Iquitos and Manus. And the Amazon River is 4,000 miles long, 60 to 160 feet deep, and it's the largest drainage system in the world. 
It covers all, it covers three million square miles of grain map. It transverses eastbound through northern Peru, the southern regions of Ecuador, and northern Brazil. For much of its path, the river is between one and six miles wide, but it's up to 12 miles wide during the rainy season when it floods. Mm -hmm. And it's so large that when it floods, it's the size of the state of California filled with water. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only one bridge across it. And along the way, it accounts for 20% of the water all the, that flows into all oceans. She has 3,000 species of fish, including piranhas, pink dolphins, hundreds of millions of birds, insects, and animal species depend on it. So it has all these special uh, animals that live in the Amazon rainforest right now. And these kind of, for instance, this kind of fish is, is only unique to this kind of area. Mm -hmm. And it looks like this. You notice it's winding here? That's because it's old. The old river winds on itself and ultimately becomes Oxbow Lakes, where this is cut off here, and carries an awful lot of sediment and water. So there's another 900 miles from Manus east to the Atlantic Ocean. And when it gets to the Atlantic Ocean, it forms a, a huge delta. And this is uh, the delta that forms the river is over 200 miles wide and sediments flow directly into the ocean. And there's a Marajo, an island right here, that's really the world's largest river island. It's 15,000 square miles, and it's the size of Switzerland. That's from all the sediment that the Amazon River dumped to put in the Atlantic Ocean, which is Marajo Island. And every second, 88 Olympic swimming-sized pools of water flow in the Atlantic Ocean. The Amazon River dumps tons of sediment and causing salinity and algae issues later on in other parts. So it forms an island that looks like this. Yes. I thought this was interesting. And they farm on it a lot there too in Marajo Island. So that's at the intersection where the Amazon River hits the uh, Atlantic Ocean, a huge delta. Thus one drop of water can travel 4,000 miles starting with snow from tall mountains in the Andes and going at one and a half miles per hour to be ultimately deposited into the Atlantic Ocean. In reality, along this super long journey, billions of gallons of water will be evaporated into the atmosphere above the Amazon. Really, there are thousands of tributaries that travel go into the Amazon, and all this water is also being evaporated at the same time. So this starts the water cycle. And it because the, then the water then condenses as vapor in the upper atmosphere for eight days and falls as rain in local areas. And this basin is as large as the United States, 48 states in totality. And it rains hundreds of times a week there in scattered areas. And then the rain makes its way up to tributaries which feed the Amazon River. So it's also evaporated and then causes rain to fall. This river empties into the Atlantic Ocean and the ocean currents carry water up to 1,000 years to fully circle the Earth and, all, and only to be forever continuously recycled in the same manner. Mm -hmm. Thus, water is never lost or gained, it's just recycled back into the system. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna uh, move on and go into the, uh, a man-made situation, which is the uh, walking or hiking the entire length of the Great Wall of China. This can be done, but it is not one continuous wall, but a series of very long, imposing stone wall sections built over thousands of years. And it is this long, 13,000 miles long, built in many different sections, and it's five times longer than the width of the United States. So how did this come to be? Uh, many of these walls were constructed to keep Mongolian armies out from the northern border, using their forces to attack. They just didn't want any person who could climb over the wall, it's about 23 feet tall, but they didn't want horses to come over, and that's why this was built. And once you're on horseback, it changes warfare. And they wanted to keep them out from the northern border. It was an elaborate fortified defense system protecting and isolating and walling off China. The total length of the wall is 13,000 miles and many unconnected sections. It's a discontinuous network of wall segments 
built by various dynasties over 2,500 years. It is a collection of walls running east and west in northern China, and it's also the world's longest cemetery. An estimated one million people died making it. <laughs> different dynasties rebuilt and added to the wall in different areas, mainly in northern China, southern Mongolia, and northeast Korea. The construction started in the Qin Dynasty in 200 BC. Let's take a look at the Qin Dynasty. This goes back now over 2,000 years, about 2,300 years, with efforts uh, by the Han Dynasty, uh, the Jin Dynasty, Han, Han, Han Dynasty from 200 BC to 200 AD, the Su Dynasty from 600 AD, the Jin Dynasty from 600 to 1200 AD, and most noticeably the Ming Dynasty, uh, which is the newest, longest, and best preserved brick wall. Prior to the Ming Dynasty, the wall was made of rammed earth or highly compacted soil in adobe, and this is some of the ways they, they did this. And in order to make the wall, in order to get all the people, excuse me, all the, okay. the people in the country to do this, they had to take everybody. They used uh, criminals, they used soldiers to participate, common people. That's how they paid their taxes back in China, was helping build this wall. And it would look something like this, with earth in the middle and then bricks on the side. Um, this is uh, generally about how they would make it. And different, like I said, different dynasties built different parts of the wall. You can see they're mainly in an east-west situation, up in northern China, and going in these kind of situations with the Qin, Han, Hui, and the Ming, for instance, is in the red. And when you go to China and visit the Great Wall, you're going to see the Ming Dynasty um, wall because of the best preserved and the newest, actually. And there's also fortified watchtowers that were built at regular intervals and could be 40 feet tall. They were lookouts, signal stations, and housed garrisons of troops plus supplies. So these things helped out every section of the little wall now and then. There were uh, the wall was never really one unified wall. The Mongol invaders, led by Genghis Khan, just went around the walls, and that's how they conquered China. So eventually they just got went around them. But I had to show you some of these pictures here about how they made this. This is kind of backbreaking work. These stones had to be quarried and then cut the sides and put in with mortar to look like this. And they've done, uh, Chinese people are very proud of this. This is a national heritage situation. It looked like this, now it looks like this. <coughs> and I wanted to show you about five pictures to just show you the beauty of this kind of a thing. It's not all, it's in disrepair in some areas, but you can still walk it. And there's really no camping on the wall. <laughs> But hikers have hiked the entire, entire parts of this wall, and some companies providing uh, camping assistance. Camping on the popular sections of the Great Wall is not allowed, especially in the built-up tourist sections like Battling, where you mainly are taken in the tourists, where there's substantial infrastructure. Uh, camping is allowed in the more open, less populated areas where it's okay. There are no toilets, no water, no trash bins, and no cooking permitted on the wall. So you have to bring everything to be able to hike this. Can you bring your own water, tent, food, supplies, etc. And 12 million tourists come to visit this area, but you can go off and, and with the company, we'll talk about in a minute here, you can visit these other areas here. This is like camping in one of the watchtowers. Now, really, are you gonna really enjoy the wall with this? Really? Okay, so you want to stay away from that and then try it. go with the company that can actually give you a walking tour of it if you wish and end up seeing this or these kind of shots. This is what I like. I like looking at this kind of thing. And for some reason I could live in this picture. So and it looks like this at night, it's lit up through the popular spots like this. 
says, you can see it goes way up there. Not so crazy. Not a good place to propose. <laughs> okay, so you can hike this, and there's a company that's called the Great Wall Hiking that offer free arranged and supported hiking tours of different sections of the wall. In six years, they have guided 3,000 hikers on long wall treks. Uh, they cover eight separate walls, and there are nine daily treks on each wall through coordinated hotel accommodations in large cities. They have guides, and so if you want to go off the beaten path, if you want to experience something, if you have the energy, then that's what I'd recommend. And this is about how to do it. Really, the best way to see a country is to do something like this. And now we're going to see another way to see a country. And this is uh, the Trans-Siberian Railroad. It's the longest railroad in the world and stretches 5,572 miles running east from Moscow all the way to Vladivostok here in very eastern Russia on the Pacific North Coast. It connects Moscow <coughs> to the Far East. The Far East. This railroad started built in 1891 and was finished in 1916, about 25 years. 62,000 soldiers, prisoners, and workers built it. It connects 87 large and small cities and generally goes like this. There's other, other you can branch off and go into Beijing and you can go up into, into Korea and other parts of Mongolia. So there's other branches you can take of this, but this is where you end up generally taking and going in an easterly direction. It uh, goes through two continents, spans eight time zones, it connects Europe and Asia, it crosses 497 bridges, goes through 15 tunnels, crosses 16 major rivers, it takes six days to do this, or 154 hours to complete its journey through the vast Russian terrain as it snakes its way through the Siberian area. The railroad also takes 200,000 containers of cargo each year. Hundreds of thousands of passengers take this. And since 2001, it has been fully electrified. Mm. And you can travel on it as a tourist. And when you get off at different stations, they have vendors there that sell things mm -hmm. uh, to people who've been on a train a long time. We're gonna go into this a little bit here. And this is first class accommodations where just two people or a couple can stay. We'll talk about the toilets in a minute, but first class <laughs> is right here. And there's other classes too, like second class where you sleep with another couple, really. Uh, one up, one down, and one here with a window here and a table. And in addition, these are the first and second class cabins. And at the end of each uh, car, and there's a toilet and washroom, a toilet and washroom here, and with an, with, an, with an egress right there. So that's second class, and second class can look like this. It is electrified, and to the outside, you have a window and a small way to get your luggage through. And third class has 54 bunks in each, um, each car. And you sleep like this, like dormitory living, and it looks like this. I would not recommend that. <laughs> but these are the passengers that you would run into in first, second, and third class. And these are the attendants. Actually, you get bedding there. They supply linen, uh, towels, uh, pillows, and blankets there. Uh, and so you can do this. They have conductors and people who do this. And some lady, for some reason, I don't think I want to run into this woman. <laughs> and uh, they also have the diner on board where they have uh, meals are served. And this is how you eat. So you can stay on this for up to six days if you wish. And it looks like this. This is the best way to see the interior of Russia. Most people go to Moscow and St. Petersburg, but this is the other way to see it. And from there, you can also go end up in Vladivostok. When you fly in from Vladivostok, you can go to Japan, visit Tokyo on your trip. From there, you can hop skip to the Hawaiian Islands and then come home. Or from Japan to Hawaii to home. So I thought about that. Okay, and lastly, 
and just, I just put this in. I don't have any notes for it. I saw this on some, uh, oh, yeah. some nature shows. This is in the Yucatan Peninsula. These are cenotes, or places where water is collected in large underground natural wells. And this forms like a ring, as you can see. This is when the, uh, remember when the dinosaurs were became extinct and a large meteor hit the Earth? Well, it hit the Yucatan right here, and it made part of this circle here of all these water wells right here, by the way. And what you can do is you can jump into these things and dive into these things. These are fresh water, and this is how the Mayans got their water. The Mayans didn't have any river, rivers when they were uh, constructing and living there back about ancient Mayans about 1,500 years ago. Rather, they uh, had buckets that came from these. They filled it up. And you can go underwater diving in these cenotes here like this. But the reason I have this on here is there's salt water at the bottom of these things, and at the top of these things, there's fresh water. So this creates an optical illusion called a halocene. And it looks like this. There's really water above him, and it looks like this. So the, the salt water sinks, the fresh water rises, and it looks like you're in two different areas. And I wanted to show you that because I thought that was really fascinating. So thank you for uh, joining with, with me today. Uh, Does anybody have any questions about these crazy journeys that no one in the world would take, <laughs> but could if you wish? Why do you want to ask? Uh, we're going to go to Egypt in uh, in May, but uh, have you been on any of these? Have you been on any of these? Uh huh. Honey, a picture. Yes. Uh, that's, I had that yesterday before, the same way, we just have to wait for turn. So that's one. I, I, I'm assuming such, yes. It's like a one-way trail. You can go from the other side, by the way, from the north side, and that's cheaper. Cheaper to do that, but it costs a little bit less for the hiking permit, but uh, it's really, you have to go the same way. Anybody else have any comments? Yes, ma'am. Um, there are only a couple routes uh, to go up to uh, Mount Everest. Oh, that's that's the way to go. There's yeah. only Th that's it. That's it. They never tried or they have covered any other yeah, way to go. There. That's really the best way to go. Uh -huh. that is the, the best I'm not way. going, then I can't. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is the best way uh -huh. to go. Yeah, I was just curious about this Camino de Santiago. Um, do they ever have problems with robberies or you know people trying to um, take your money? Thank you for asking. It's not isolated. Uh, there's always hundreds of people on the trail walking, generally speaking. So the answer is no. No, Spain has done a very good job with that. You're always with, just about with somebody. And the best thing to do is to go with a group in the first place because that's what passes the time. That's what 